Where was Elijah taken up when he was taken up in the whirlwind if, he, if heaven was closed at that time? That's a question that's a good question, and I've often gotten that question. Uh, it, it reminds me kind of of a story that, um, that I'll, I'll relate to you. Uh, once the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen was preaching at a university in California, and as he was uh, preaching, he, he was starting to be heckled. And um, somebody said to him, well, after Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale and he preached and he, he died, did Jonah go to heaven? And Bishop Sheen said, well, uh, when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. <laughs> and, the, and the heckler said, what if he's not there? And he said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> so as far as where Elijah was taken up when he was taken up in the world, well, when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. Right now, I don't know. But we do know that the fact that... Uh, our Lady was immaculately conceived, which is a singular grace. The fact she was assumed into heaven body and soul, which is the consequence of that singular grace of the Immaculate Conception, that pretty much tells us that the only spiritualized, glorified bodies in heaven are Jesus and Mary. Uh, as far as Elijah, it certainly says he was taken up in a whirlwind. That's the answer to that question quite simply. We don't know. If I had to guess, he was taken to that place of the just to wait for Christ. The fact he's taken up, what does that mean? Well, it means he's, he's a just man. He's a true prophet, a servant of God, and saved. And so, in a sense, we can say we're taken up when we're saved. But as far as going to heaven, uh, we can't justify that in the doctrine of the faith. But, you know, the real answer is um, when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. I have a grandson who says after 12 years of Catholic school that he doesn't believe in heaven, hell, or purgatory. He doesn't believe in God and more and more and more. What can I do? Well, you know, the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Uh, sometimes we're hard on Catholic schools or parishes or whatever, and we say, well, after 12 years, of teaching, they don't know the faith. Uh, well, sometimes it's the fault of those teaching, maybe, but sometimes, you know, you, you don't want to be too hard on them. Sometimes it's the fault of the person receiving. I went to Catholic school when I was young, and I had good sisters and good teaching, uh, but it didn't seem to stick with me. It wasn't their fault. They did a good job, those sisters. They, they did a good job, not their fault that I came out of there in my teens not really caring. Oh, I never renounced the faith or anything like that. I just drifted away from it. But what can you do? Certainly you can pray. And certainly we can do all that we can to live Christ and for our part to teach the truth in whatever environment it is. Remember where the first line of catechesis is, home. Mom and dad are the chief catechists of their children. Mom and dad have to know the faith in order to hand it on. The parish can help you, the Catholic schools can help you, but mom and dad are where the faith comes from. That's the way it always was, really. You get it at home. If you don't get it at home, then God will have to do something later, like he, he did. I got it at home, and it still didn't take, as they say. But later on, the good Lord in his mercy worked it all out, and he'll do that for your children, too, and grandchildren. Uh, you mentioned that the heavenly host can't sin. How does that relate to the casting out of Satan? Well, Satan is not part of the heavenly host. You know, sa Satan, in the beginning, the angels had a test, and the ones that failed, that didn't accept God's plan, they were, as a, in a sense, cast out of heaven. But that preternatural, that, that test in primordial times, uh, that's an extraordinary thing. Uh, 
the, the angels were given a test. They either passed it or failed it. Because of their intelligence, because of their much higher uh, intelligence and freedom of will, they didn't get the same kind of chance that we do. See, we're much lower than the angels in terms of natural gifts of intelligence and freedom of will. The angels got an instantaneous chance. The ones that got it wrong, that's it. But it's perfectly just that God would do that because they had an understanding of God, and yet they apostatized. In the end, it's a mystery. You know, that's, it, that sounds like a cop-out, but there are certain things we just don't know that much about. And so now, after the Lord has been sent, suffered, died, rose again, all those who are in heaven are confirmed in grace. In the beatific vision, they can't sin. So, you know, that's all, all the saints in heaven, all the blessed, the angels. They can't sin. Why? Does that mean they're not free? No, it means they're truly free. Remember that sinning isn't an exercise of freedom. That's an exercise of license. And you lose your freedom by abusing your freedom. And so those in heaven have been set free. You've got to be free to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. The liberation of the beatific vision. That's something magnificent, and we have that to look forward to. You mentioned the holding place before Jesus Christ was resurrected. Is this the same place as purgatory? No, not exactly, I don't think. Once again, there's not an absolute teaching on it. But it, it, it was analogous to purgatory, you could say, analogous to purgatory. Whether or not it's the purgatory of now that we talk about, nobody know, knows. If so, is purgatory still in existence today? Yes, purgatory is a doctrine of the faith. Now, once in a while, you'll hear people say, I don't believe in purgatory. Well, okay, but you, you don't believe what the church believes then. Purgatory is not optional teaching. It's doctrine. Purgatory is real. The question is, what is it? Well, we don't know exactly, except that it's a place of final purification. That's what purgatory is. As to how that purification takes place, we don't know. Hopefully, I will not be able to say when I get there. I'll let you know. Most of us would like to skip that stage and go right up on the holy elevator. But purgatory, the existence of it, is certainly, that's a doctrine of the faith. Why must I die? That's a good question. That's a question that human beings have asked throughout the ages. Why? Why must I die? Or why must I suffer? It's all wrapped up in this mystery, the Paschal mystery, that I talked to you about this afternoon. The concept, you know, Scripture says the wages of sin is death. St. John says, Anyone who says he is without sin is a liar. We inherit original sin through the natural process of human generation. You may say, but that's not fair. And I said, well, take it up with the Lord. That's the way it is. You know, our first parents, and you know, however you read that account of the garden uh, in the book of Genesis, whether or not uh, that is uh, word for word, exactly, historically true, doesn't matter. Maybe yes, maybe no. But the contents that it conveys, the assertions it makes, that our humanity, every human being, comes from that first set of parents, the Bible calls them Adam and Eve, that's doctrine. That's absolute. Now, whether or not, in fact, they were in a real garden and so forth and so on, I don't know why anybody would want to doubt that, but it doesn't matter, doctrinally speaking. The fact of the matter is, yes, we come from a first set of parents that God created out of nothing, ex nihilo, as it says in Latin, from nothing. And yes, they fell through original sin, that first sin, which I explained to you. That's where death came from. The wages of sin is death. Why must I die? Because I'm human. It's part of the whole package. We inherit the consequences of original sin. The natural result of sin is death. There was no death 
until original sin entered the universe. Nobody died until through the abuse of free will, our first parents, in a sense, stepped out of the wisdom of God. When you step out of the wisdom of God, do it your way instead of God's way, you step out of the light. Without light, you know, death ensues. In the natural order, we know that we need light for life to flourish on our planet. No light of the sun, no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis, no plant life. No plant life, nothing for the animals to eat. Everything dies. Same in the moral and spiritual order. Step out of God's wisdom, you step out of the light, into the darkness. What happens? You begin to wither and die, morally and spiritually. We die because we have sinned. Number one, because we're human, the original sin, which is inherited. But you say, but I've been baptized. Yes, but the consequences of sin, the tendency to sin remain, and we do sin, personally. I need to go to confession. I'm a sinner. And, and because of that, that natural consequence of sin is death. But you say, death is, a, is evil. Why would God, who's supposed to be good, God is goodness itself, God is love, God is mercy, why would he allow death? Why would he allow cancer? Why would he allow the things that go on in Africa and Bosnia, millions dying, starvation, wars? If God's so good, if God loves us, if God's merciful, then why? Why? Don't ask why. Ask how. Can you glorify God in your present circumstances? God allows evil only for one reason, to bring a greater good out of it. I will give you perfect advice as to how to advance in wisdom on this point. You take a crucifix. I always have one. You take a crucifix, and you look at it for the rest of your life. You meditate on it. You think about it, and you look what you see there. You see Jesus, perfectly innocent, the Son of God, suffering and dying. Why did God the Father allow such an evil? To bring the great good of redemption out of it. And God allows us to suffer and die only to bring a greater good out of it. What's the greater good? Happiness in heaven for all eternity. That's why we suffer. That's why we die but oriented only towards resurrection. Death, physical death, is not an end. It's a beginning. It is a door which we pass through on our way to a higher and more beautiful life. In relation to this earthly body being resurrected, what is the church's view on organ donations and cremation? Well, the church now allows both, and that's the short answer. Organ donation is ethically permitted, and now, uh, cremation is e ethically and morally permitted so long as we don't say, we're not making a statement that we don't respect the holiness of the body. You know, this body, which is the temple of God, is a holy thing. And as long as cremation isn't some kind of philosophical statement that let's get rid of the, the mess, as long as that's not the case, the church permits cremation today realizing that the body belongs to God, came from God, and it's going back to God eventually. So both organ donation and cremation today are permitted by the Catholic Church. Okay, um, I have two questions. Was Eve's act of disobedience part of God's plan? If not, why did it occur? All right, the whole thing can be incorporated into God's plan. Remember that nothing can happen, even evil. Not that God wills evil, but nothing can happen that's outside what we could call the permissive will of God. Was it part of God's plan? Yes. Was Eve free? Yes. Did God coerce her to do that? No, he did not. She was free. She was free to do what was right, but didn't. That was an abuse of human freedom. God knew because he's God, by definition, God knew from all eternity that that's the way it would go. Did God will evil? No. Did God permit the evil? Yes. Why? To bring an even greater good out of it. So yes, that whole scenario is part of God's plan. Now how does one know 
that all the church's doctrine is apostolic and therefore worthy of obedience. In other words, true. How do we know it's not corrupted by human fallibility? A very good question, one that, that many people can and should rightly ask. How do we know that what the church teaches really came from the apostles? How do we know what we should believe and what we can choose not to accept? You hear this very often. You hear it say, well, that's made up by men. Okay, let's look at that statement. I, I've been through this a million times. One time in Wyoming, I had a group of uh, fine people, uh, Protestant brothers and sisters, descend on me at a ranch where I was staying. And they asked me a lot of these questions. And, and they said, well, we don't have to believe that. Uh, we don't accept that. Okay, amen. You have a free will. Nobody can coerce anybody. God himself doesn't force anyone to believe anything. How do we know? Well, without, I could give hours and days and months of teaching on this. Jesus instituted his church upon himself, really. Jesus is the rock, the chief cornerstone upon which the heavenly Jerusalem is built. But in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus asks a question. Who do men say that I am? He took a Gallup poll. And he got answers like, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. You see, one question, who am I? Who do people say I am? Conflicting and contradictory responses to the same question. Now, they couldn't all be right. Now, you see, that's what happened when you ask the people at large, when you take a Gallup poll. You see, eternal truth isn't determined by a democratic vote nor a Gallup poll. But Jesus asked, who do they say that I am? Nobody answered. And then he said, but who do you? Speaking, no doubt, to his apostles. Who do you say that I am? One voice had the answer. One rang out. Peter, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, no mere man has revealed this to you, Peter, but my heavenly Father. And I, for my part, declare that you are rock, with a capital R. That's what Peter means. You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, Jesus grafted Peter into himself. Now, Peter's not God. Jesus is God. But Jesus brought Peter into himself. It's a kind of a marriage. You know how it is in marriage, the two become one. As the Bible says, the two become one flesh. The church and Christ are one. Peter, representing the body of Christ, Christ the head of his mystical body, the church, they become one. Now when Peter teaches in faith and morals, that's the, the apostolic teaching, that's Christ's teaching through him. He has a guarantee of the Holy Spirit, which was given by Christ. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me and him who sent me. So Peter, when he teaches in faith and morals, and the successors of St. Peter, the popes, when they teach in faith and morals, there's a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? It's part of divine revelation. But then you say, but I don't believe that. That doesn't sound plausible to me. And then I say to you, you are walking by sight, not by faith. There isn't anything in the Holy Bible that says, without understanding, it is impossible to please God. But I assure you that it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so you say, I don't believe that. I can't understand that. Peter's just a man. Pope's just a man. Well, I tell you, God's revealed that upon this rock he will build his church, and that whatever he declares bound on earth will be held bound in heaven. And that means, and it has meant from the beginning, that Peter, the Pope, and the bishops united to him when they teach in matters of faith and morals have a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. How do we know what's what? That's why we're studying the faith. Now, is everything that the church teaches of divine revelation? No, but faith and morals, those things that we are taught in the catechism, must we believe those? Yes. Are there different kinds of belief? Well, yes. We have some things like the Trinity, 
uh, the Eucharist, the seven sacraments, all those essential items of the faith, we have to give what's called divine and Catholic assent because they're divine revelation. But all the other things the church teaches, are we obliged to accept them? Yes, yes, but with what's called assent of intellect and will, religious assent. We respect the church's teaching in those other items. Does anyone have the right to dissent from authentic and authoritative church teaching? No. And I'll tell you, I get a lot of flack from people, which is okay, which is okay. They say, we have a right to dissent. There is no right to dissent from authentic, authoritative church teaching. We have to accept it. That's faith. There's no other way. But you say, but once uh, the church taught that, um, you know, usury was okay or something, that's not a matter of faith and morals. Well, once the church said that it was a mortal sin if you ate meat on Friday, that changed. Of course it changed. Is it faith and morals? No, of course not. When the church teaches in faith and morals, those are those essential beliefs that we have. Now, a another question in here said, you know, when I make that distinction between tradition with a capital T, that's part of divine revelation, one of the ways God reveals himself to us, as distinguished with tradition from a small t. And the person made the point, I think that tradition with a small t is important. I think it helps us to live the faith. And they said, Don't, do you agree? I, I do agree. Many of the traditions which have come down to us do help us. But many of the customs that have been in previous ages, they can and sometimes should change. Now, whether or not we eat meat on Friday or not, those things can change. Whether we celebrate Mass in Latin or not, that can change from age to age. It doesn't affect the doctrine of the faith, faith and morals. And, you know, the church is kind of like a great and mighty river. Two elements, the rock-solid bed of the river, that's the unchangeable truth. That's what can't change. That's faith and morals. But then a river also has a dynamism, a current, and that current sweeps and shifts and it changes. Well, certain things in the church can and should change to meet changing times, but the rock-solid bed of the river, that's the truth, faith and morals, that can't change. And so try to understand where the lines are. That's a function of studying. There's a difference between discipline and doctrine. The, the doctrine of the faith can't change. How do we know what the doctrine of the faith is about. Well, I'll tell you what, we're working on it right now. It's in here, okay? That's how you know. And as you gain experience and study and pray more and experience your faith, you will come to have a taste for the truth. You know, if you're trained in music, you recognize good music. You have an ear for good music. An ear trained in music recognizes a discordant note when it hears it. An ear trained for truth recognizes a discordant note in the symphony of truth. And so as you train your spiritual ears for the truth, the teaching of the church, you'll gain a very sharp ear and you'll know how to recognize truth from error. Please do not gasp, all right? I believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, but I do not understand the doctrinal consequences if, in fact, subsequent to the virgin birth of Jesus, she had other children with Joseph. There's no sin in this, and children are a blessing. Absolutely true. So why does the ever, vir the, the ever in the ever virgin have doctrinal significance? Well, there's a very deep spiritual meaning to it. Absolutely true. Sometimes people look at the negative side of this. The statement that Mary was ever virgin is not somehow a statement belittling marriage or children. Uh, having children, being a mother and a father, that's a great blessing for, for, uh, from God. That, there's not a sin there, that's a blessing, of course. And it doesn't imply that there's any sin or anything negative in having children. That's a great gift from God. But there's another category of gifts spiritual gifts, and I went through in the teaching on this
some of the consequences of this concept of Mary being ever virgin, that it indicates the, the high mystical quality of her faith, that it was not adulterated by any doubt, by anything dark. And in a sense, you see, Mary belongs to God alone. Her spouse is the Holy Spirit. And it's only fitting that the one who would be the mother of God would have God for her spouse. You see, there's higher and mystical significance in these things. But it's not a negative thing. It's not a statement that there's something less than holy about marriage. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in San Francisco doing a conference on the family. And I have a talk that's going to be on the, the great sanctity of marriage. Oh, marriage is holy. It's tremendous. It's a great good. But the perpetual virginity of Mary is an even greater good. You see, out of her virginity, out of her total consecration, both in body and in spirit, she brought forth children. She's not only the mother of her only son. She's a spiritual mother of all the living, everyone in a state of grace on their way to heaven. She's a mother to sinners as well. She hopes for their conversion. She prays for them. They call priest father. Let me try to explain it this way. They call priest father. Why? It says in the Bible, you're to call no man your father. It's another question that was asked. Well, okay, there's only one father, God. God is the only father, just like Jesus is the only priest. Aha! So then why do you Catholics call priest father? Well, we don't have a separate fatherhood. There's only one father and there's only one priest. We enter in to the paternity of God the Father and make it present, just like we enter in to the priesthood of Jesus Christ and make it present. They call us father because we are in the spiritual order. I remember early in my vocation, for an instant I've told this story before I was about to read at a monastery where I was a novice on Sunday morning. The church was packed and in the front row there was a very beautiful young blonde girl and she looked up at me and smiled. And at that instant, I had a pain in my heart. <laughs> in an instant, I was sorrowful because a thought came to me, I would never know the joy of marriage. I would never know what it means to share my life with one person that God had arranged for me to be with all my life. I would never know the joy of being the father of children. And that all happened, that understanding, in an instant, very quickly. And it, and it pierced my heart with sorrow that I would never know this beautiful gift of having a spouse and children. But almost instantaneously, a pure light came to me. Oh, I know visions or words, or, but, it, but in my heart, I knew it was like this. Oh, you will be espoused. You will have a wife. I will give you the most beautiful wife imaginable, for you will be in my son and his bride, the church, will be your wife, and you will have children beyond counting. The gift of celibacy or virginity is a mystical gift, a charism, which brings spiritual life into the church, and that's why they call priests father, because we are. And I'll tell you what, that premonition proved true because I have children even only after five years as a priest more than I can count more than I would ever have physically our ladies perpetual virginity brings forth spiritual life and it's a great blessing please explain the scripture where Christ says to the thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise what is today what is paradise and who is me uh, if Christ went to Hades the day he died, this isn't clear. Well, like most things, it is shrouded in mystery, and it's not clear, absolutely correct. But he did say it. Now, the easy part is, who's the me? Today you will be with me. Who said it? Jesus said it. Who is Jesus? He's a divine person, the Son of God. He's the only one that could make a statement like that. Only God has the power to say, today you will be with me in paradise. What's paradise? Heaven, 
eternal bliss, but he went to Hades that day. Yes, but we don't know how long he spent there. And then he rose on the third day, and you can say, well, but, but, you know, he died on Friday, and he rose on Sunday. That's not three days. Yes, it is, in the Jewish way of counting days. Friday's one, Saturday's two, Sunday's three. That's the third day, and that's how they counted time then. Mary benefited, first of all, and uniquely from Christ's victory over sin. She was preserved from all stain of original sin, and by a special grace of God committed no sin of any kind. When you say Mary could not sin, is that the language of doctrine in the catechism, or is it an interpretation, even a theological opinion? Uh, there are many things, you know, <laughs> the catechism is a great enterprise, and it's filled with the truth, but it does not say everything that is, there is to say about the faith. Now, is it just a mere opinion that Mary couldn't sin? No. No. Is it theology? Yes, it is. Is it true? Yes, it is. Why couldn't she sin? Because she was confirmed in grace, full of grace. No original sin, hence no consequences of original sin, no attraction to sin. She was so perfectly immersed in grace that she couldn't sin. Then she's not free, you might say. Oh, yes. Then she's free more eminently then anyone is free. She's free with the freedom that Jesus came for. Jesus didn't come to set us free from some kind of political tyranny like the Jews of that time thought and like some today who misinterpret a certain kind of liberation theology. No, Jesus came to set us free from sin, Satan, and eternal death. And she was truly free of all that. Is she free from sin? Yes. Then she's truly free. Free to do what? free to do the highest and best thing at all times. What's that? To know God, to love God, and to serve God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. That's real freedom. So Our Lady was not only full of grace, but because of that, totally free. She's the original liberated woman. That's women's liberation. Why is contraception considered evil? Two priests told me in certain situations there is a gray area regarding this and that the Pope could not say yes to artificial contraception, so he had to say no. Anyway, I was told it was okay for me, but I couldn't go along with it. All right. You see, you know, I try very hard to stay out of trouble. <laughs> and almost never succeed. Let me see what I can do now to get in lots of trouble. Is it a teaching of the church? Is it a moral teaching that artificial contraception is intrinsically evil? Yes. Is it the real teaching of the church? Yes. Is it permissible? Can I engage in artificial contraception under certain circumstances? No. No. Now, there's a difference between artificial contraception and taking that pill that regulates the cycle of ovulation for a health reason. That's not artificial contraception when the birth control pill is taken for another reason, when the end that it's taken for is not contraception. So two separate questions. So someone could say, well, is it a sin I'm taking the, the pill to regulate a cycle or to do something else? Or if you're not taking it to prevent conception, that's a different question. The question is, is it intrinsically evil to engage in artificial contraception? The answer is yes. The Pope didn't have to do anything. The Pope doesn't have to teach anything except what the Church has taught throughout the ages, which is the teaching of Jesus Christ. That the Pope has to teach. And anything other than that, he cannot teach. So in a certain sense, does he have to teach it? Of course. Can the Pope begin to teach that God is one God and four divine persons? Of course not. Can the Pope teach that there are 14 sacraments instead of seven? Of course not. Doesn't matter. All the Petrine authority cannot change the teaching of Jesus Christ one little bit. And so, the Pope has to teach what the Church teaches, and he does. Artificial contraception is intrinsically even, evil. Can anyone say, well, it's okay for you, go ahead. 
No, no one can say that. No priest, no bishop, nobody can counteract the teaching of the church. Just not possible. What if a bishop's conference says, well, in this country, it's okay? No way. You can't do that. Nobody has the authority to short circuit, to suppress, to change the teaching of Jesus Christ. Artificial contraception is intrinsically evil. The church teaches it. We have to accept that. We have to obey that. But you say, what, what's so bad about it? I can't understand what's so bad. That's the problem. A lot of people can't understand. The church, our Holy Mother, has a wisdom far beyond most of our personal wisdom. Quickly, let me address it. You have to understand what love is, marital love. You have to understand what sexuality is. It is the expression of the interior love which the spouses have for each other. There are two ends in marriage procreation and the mutual help of the spouses. Not only procreation and not only the mutual consolation or aid of the spouses, both. Marriage has two ends, not one. Procreation and the mutual exchange, the interchange of love. So what happens in the marital act? Well, it is a sacramental thing. Why? Because externally, physically, Husband and wife express the interior love which they have for each other. In the nuptial meaning of the body, the husband is saying, I am all yours. All of me belongs to you. And the wife is saying, likewise, everything that I am and have, I give to you. When you engage in artificial contraception, you are saying, not all of me, the deepest part of me that part of me which allows us together to enter into the very power of God's creative ability, pro-creation. You have no access to that, and at the level of the subconscious, it registers as rejection. You can go this far, but no farther can you go, for I will not allow you to come together with me to cooperate with God to bring new life into existence. That is intrinsically evil. And you may say, then I have to have 20 children. We can't afford it. My body can't take it. My mind can't take it. And the church doesn't teach it. Let's get it right. Yes, for a serious reason, you can delay the birth of another child even indefinitely. That's what the church teaches. Natural family planning is the way that you do it or serious reason. Your, your body can't possibly go through another pregnancy. Uh, you can't possibly psychologically take it right now, so you defer. The church allows for that. Perfectly permissible natural family planning. And of course, the other method is called abstinence. There's two, two methods. But why is it intrinsically evil? Because love. Marital love, sexuality, is such a sacred thing. When you enter into the realm of sexuality, you enter into a holy of holies. You enter into a sacred space. And because of that, we dare not to profane that which is holy. Nowadays, people have come to regard sex as a game, a trivial thing. And they trample upon, like it's a game of tennis, means nothing. No, it's sacred. And for that reason, we want to maintain the sacral nature of human sexuality. That's why it's intrinsically evil. Because the church doesn't have a low esteem for sex. It has a high, noble, and exalted esteem for human sexuality. What do you say to those who do not go to church because they feel that people who do go are hypocrites? Well, I've heard that a lot. You have too. Uh, are many of us hypocrites? Yes. Yes. That's the sad part. But listen, uh, it, it, because somebody is a hypocrite or because someone's an outright sinner, if the pastor is the worst sinner in the world, am I going to rationalize 
and say, I'm not going to church because look at that, the priest's no good, he's a sinner. That's ridiculous. That's the old saying like cutting your nose off to spite your face. It's ridiculous. I'm not going to let somebody else's sin stand in the way of my salvation. God's given us the full means to achieve our salvation. Let's not, you know when you hear that, you know what that is? That's a rationalization for somebody who doesn't want to be bothered. Oh, you're all hypocrites. Well, buddy, you just don't want to get up on Sunday morning, maybe. You know, a lot of us are hypocrites, but that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ, head of the church, is a hypocrite. It doesn't mean that you have to be a hypocrite. The saints weren't hypocrites. They lived the faith. They were serious about it, and many of us are too. So that's just a, a lame excuse. My uncle feels it is very unfair that the first group of workers did not receive more pay for putting in more hours of work. <laughs> Can you explain Christ's meaning of this parable? Yes, I hope so. God is God. Jesus said this in the parable. Hey, look, isn't the boss able to say who gets paid what? You know, you contracted to work for a certain amount. I said, I'd pay you so much, and you got it. It's like somebody comes, I'll pay you $5 an hour, $10 an hour. You come, you do your work, you get paid $10 an hour. Somebody else comes along, works one hour. You know, you pay him 100 bucks. And the first guy comes, like, hey, what'd you pay him? Hey, my money, my vineyard. That's what God's saying. Don't try to uh, second guess God. Now, in a sense, though, is there a justice in the way things work with God? Of course, perfect justice. The fact of the matter is, if you come at the last minute, uh, let's say you and I were terrible sinners to the day we reached 100 years, and then on our deathbed we repented. We repented, say, Lord, forgive me. Jesus has mercy on us. We may spend a, a while in purgatory, but we're saved. The Lord's mercy is there. Hey, you go right to the end. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody to wait till the last minute. But the fact of the matter is, you, wait, you know, even if you do, you have the grace of conversion on your deathbed, but you are a miserable person all your life. Well, does God's mercy extend to those people? Yes. Isn't God God? Can't he give mercy at the last minute like he did to the cross, the thief on the cross who stole heaven, as Bishop Sheen used to say? Of course God can do that, and he does do it. What about, oh, yeah, but what about me? All my life I've been faithful. I never commit mortal sins. I was in the church. I went to Mass every day. Don't worry. Just because the other guy also got into heaven, remember this. Your reward will be great for your fidelity. We are given the degree of glory in heaven forever, directly proportional to the degree of charity we attain on earth. Those who've worked at it long and hard, in a sense, expand their capacity to love. Your acts of charity throughout the years, your rosaries, your masses, all your good works, they expand your capacity for love. And it's that capacity for love which results in the direct proportion of glory in heaven. And so throughout your life, you work at it, you pray, you're always faithful, more and more capacity for love. Finally, you go to heaven, and you're filled with heaven, with, with, with this tremendous grace of God. Your degree of glory is greater. Now, in heaven, everybody's perfectly happy. St. Therese, the little flower, put it this way. Everyone's perfectly happy in heaven. Everyone's glass is filled to the brim, but some people's glasses are bigger than others. Your capacity for glory is directly proportional to the degree of charity you attain on earth. And so there is a justice to it. I'm bald, and at the resurrection of the body will my hair return when my glorified body comes back. I like that question. And I like the answer even better. I remember my first month in the seminary. I was at Mass at the seminary chapel, and the director of vocations that morning, uh, 
uh, on the altar, uh, there was the director of vocations, Father Brad Pearson. He had another priest I didn't recognize, uh, a rather large, stocky man with a huge mane of gray hair. And it was the founder of my religious order. He's coming to visit next week, Father J James Flanagan. And the way that uh, Father Pierce introduced him was he said, and on my right, the gentleman with the transfigured hair. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get it all back, and it'll all be perfect. <laughs> Several weeks ago, a letter to the editor in the Catholic Herald claimed that the church has changed its teaching on issues like slavery, sex, and marriage, the Jews being responsible for Jesus' crucifixion, etc. Could you please comment? Yes, glad to. The church has not changed its teaching on any essential matter of faith or morals. I said that before. The church never formally taught that the Jews are responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Many people in the church deduced that, yes. But the church never taught that in her doctrine, just as the church never taught that sex is evil. That was one of the first heresies that came along, Manichaean dualism. We've never taught that sex is dirty or evil in the Catholic Church. There were people in the church throughout the ages who thought that, construing the church's teaching wrongly. The church has not changed one of its teachings in faith and morals. And you have these things get thrown in our face all the time and sometimes by our own. The church, the church teaches today what she always taught, which is the teaching of Jesus Christ. So don't be confused by these claims that the church changes her teaching. Hey, we had to not eat meat on Friday once. We had to have Mass in Latin. That's not faith and morals. That's discipline. There's a very big difference between the doctrine of the faith and discipline in the church. Why the anthropocentric reference towards God as he or him? Is God not genderless? God is above gender. God is not male or female. Divinity. God and his divinity. Absolutely true. God is beyond gender. Why do we call God he, then, or him, in the Bible? Quite simply because it's the language of revelation. We didn't make it up. Remember who the primary author of sacred scripture is? God. That's a teaching of the faith. God is the primary author of sacred scripture. And he refers to himself as father. And he refers to Jesus as son. When Jesus assumed a human nature, was it a male human nature? Of course it was. Him. He. Now God himself refers to that. Is that a slight to women? No. Is divinity male or female? No, it includes both masculine and femininity. God transcends gender. That's, that's about divinity. But the language of revelation is not something men made up was something given by the Holy Spirit to the church. So yes, it is true that God in his divinity, the Godhead, is both masculine and feminine. After all, women, just like men, came forth from God, the creating hand of God. He's genderless. He transcends gender. In a manner of speaking, I shouldn't say he's genderless. That's not a true statement. He is all-inclusive. For male and female, he made them. Who made them? God made them. Therefore, God includes both. He's not masculine. He's not feminine. He transcends masculinity and femininity. But we use the language he gave us, the language of revelation. Why did God let sin enter the world? It must have been known before creation, Lucifer, and so forth. Well, I think I addressed that, that the reason God allowed it to happen was to bring a greater good out of it. It's not that God wills evil. God doesn't will evil, especially moral evil. But God did permit the free will activity of both men and angels. And then when we abused free will, sin entered the universe. God in his power, because God transcends everything, he's all-powerful, omnipotent, he brought a greater good 
even out of the evil. The Bible says that once married, we can never marry again. But our church is allowing divorce under a tribunal approval. What is, what is true? If tribunal divorce is approved, can we remarry? Well, there's no such thing as tribunal divorce. Divorce is not according to God's will and mind. The church doesn't, in a tribunal, deal with divorce. The church, in her marriage tribunal, deals with annulment. There's a difference between a divorce and an annulment. If you are validly married, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. What we deal with in the tribunal is the declaration of the nullity of a marriage. Now, what does that mean? It means that the marriage never existed. It means that from the beginning, because of a lack of capacity to consent, because of immaturity, because of some psychological defect, the, the partners didn't have the right or, or the uh, ability to enter into that, that, that covenant and contract of marriage. So a tribunal simply declares that either the marriage was valid or not. It had nothing to do with divorce, all right? There is the, the problem comes with if you're validly married in the church, you're a Catholic, you're validly married, all right? No annulment. You can't remarry so long as the other spouse is still living. That's, that's the law of the church. That's the teaching of Jesus Christ. He said it right in the Gospels. And there is a great problem today. Let's say someone is married validly in the Catholic Church, gets divorced, gets remarried, no annulment. There's a problem with that. Now, we sympathize with it, and we have to be uh, very gentle and very helpful to people. Many people are in that kind of situation, but we have to tell the truth. You know, we have to tell the truth. You don't want to facilitate sin. Divorce and remarriage is a serious sin. If you're really married validly, get divorced, remarried, you, you, you definitely cannot approach the sacraments. Why? Because you're living in an adulterous relationship. You're already married, and now you're having sexual relations with somebody else. That's the teaching of the church. Hey, I run into trouble for that. Well, I'll tell you what, that's part of the truth. That's the authentic teaching of the church. Do we still love those people and help them? You better believe it. We better help them. But it is not a help to say, oh, it's okay, go ahead. There are places where I've gotten in trouble for bringing this out. I intend to keep getting in trouble because I'll tell you something. It's absolutely unconscionable to allow that to go on without a kind, charitable, patient response. Brother, please don't do that. And even if the priest says it's okay, remember this. No priest has the right to short circuit, to suppress, to obfuscate the teaching of Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as legitimate divorce and remarriage in the Catholic Church. There is such things as the declaration that the marriage never existed. That's an annulment. And there are often grounds for that. How can you examine where God was when a good person is hurt in a horrible accident? For example, when a child is physically molested by a parent, where was God? Why didn't he protect his little one? I guess I'm asking... Why do bad things happen to good people? This is a question which reverberates throughout history. Why, oh why, if God is a loving God, if God is goodness itself, why then do bad things happen to good people? I will tell you the answer without even saying a word. Think about it. There is the Son of God, perfectly innocent, crucified. The greatest evil that ever took place was the crime of deicide, the murder of the Creator by creatures. And you have to look long and hard at a crucifix to fathom 
the meaning of evil. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? In order to bring a greater good out of it. That's the worst thing that ever happened. But you know what? It turned into the greatest thing that ever happened. The gift of redemption. And so, when your loved ones, like I have a friend in Wyoming, their little boy has had leukemia since his earliest days. He's suffered constantly now for three and a half years. He might have died last night, I'm not even sure. That little boy has known nothing but suffering, and his family are the best Catholics that I know. Why do such horrible things happen? I'll tell you why. Because God gives the biggest share of his cross to his best friends. That's why bad things happen to good people. Well, how can the church discern whether a bishop is in union with the Holy Father? Well, I, I'm very careful about that. I'll tell you, I don't like, I would not want to be the one to pass judgment on any bishop because you do not know what is in his head or in his, what is in his heart. If he is basically doing his job, if he's trying uh, to pass on the teaching of the church, if he doesn't overtly reject any tenet of faith or morals, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, I, I'm going to tell you something I learned. I suffered a long time, too, as a layperson from a lot of bad teaching. Some of the liturgies I sat through, I, will, I, I tell you, I might not have to go to purgatory. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's a tragedy, but I learned after I became a priest that nobody knows what a priest or a bishop goes through except a priest or a bishop. Because I tell you this, don't be hard on them. Don't be hard on us. I'll tell you why. Because the devil literally attacks a priest and even more a bishop more than he does in any, anyone else. Why? Because he's a tactician. The devil is a strategist a general of an evil army, and if you strike the shepherd, you can scatter the sheep. And so you don't know what terrible suffering, temptation, discouragement, and despondency the priest or the bishop might go through. Try not to judge them, because you know, if we were in their place, they might be a heck of, we, we might be a heck of a lot worse than they are. I came to learn this, and I'm learning it every day more and more. The bishops have the hardest job in the world next to the Holy Father. They have the weight of the moral universe upon them. We need to love them. We need to be compassionate to them and try to understand them. We need to support them, and our priests too. I tell you, many a priest has had his spirit broken. They have drifted away from the spiritual life. Jesus in the Eucharist is not the center of their life, but that can happen to anyone. It's very subtle and insidious. And so we should not condemn them nor criticize them. We should love them. We should love them very much. And in loving them, we will draw them back. We'll draw them back through the power of love. Sometimes love is a crucifying thing. Once again, you've got to look there to Jesus on the cross to understand how we are to approach some of our brethren who are not doing everything they should do and not living the way that they should live. I, if I were in their place, would probably be a thousand times worse than any of them. We just don't know until we walk in their shoes. And so let's try not to judge them. When will the church allow priests to marry? <laughs> well, now, let me explain something to you. And, and it's very important 
to be, I want, I want you to be the best educated people in the church. When we get finished with this course, I want it to be said that the people that went through this course, they really know their faith. They know where the lines are. Now, there are some things that are theologically impossible. The question of the ordination of women, it is a theological impossibility. And does that mean that the church discriminates against women? No. The greatest member of the church is a woman. There isn't an angel even close to the woman named Mary. She wasn't a priest, and remember this, the greatest in the kingdom aren't the ministers, they're the saints. And so equal in dignity, but differentiated as to function. You women don't need to be priests to be fulfilled. You need to be women to be fulfilled. And I don't need to be anything other than a priest to be fulfilled. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest things in the world is to be a woman and to be a mother, to bring forth new life into the world, life which will never cease to be, that will go on for all eternity, praising God. I will never know that joy. But I am not mad at God, and I am not mad at the church. Now, the church could allow priests to marry. In the early church, priests were married, and bishops too. <clears throat> it is not a theological <clears throat> impossibility for a priest to be married. It happened before. Now, there's a difference between what is theologically possible and what is expedient or good. Let me explain to you briefly the charism of celibacy. Priests are called to celibacy in the Western Church. Celibacy is a charism. A charism, by definition, is a gift given to a person for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the Church. It's a gift given to a person by God for the building up of the body of Christ, the Church. Now, let me ask you something. If God has given us a gift, who would be so stupid as to throw it back in his face? If God has given us a gift whose specific reason for existing is to infuse supernatural life into the church, then why would we throw that gift back in his face at a time in history when we are desperately in need of an infusion of supernatural life? Let me tell you something. I am delighted to be a priest and to be celibate. It doesn't take anything away from me. It helps me to be what I was created to be. I am a father, and ain't none of you guys have more kids than me. <laughs> and our religious sisters, the beautiful spouses of Christ, I remember once I was standing with a religious sister and a very well-meaning woman came up to us and she looked at us and just shook her head and went, tsk, tsk, tsk. Oh, poor father, poor sister. Uh, you will never be able to be married. You will never have children. You are, you are so deprived. And she went on and on and on and on. And I turned to sister and I said, praise the Lord, I'm confirmed in celibacy. <laughs> You think we're missing something? You're very wrong. You're very wrong. Marriage is magnificent. It is a sacrament. It is beautiful. It's a gift from God if you're called to it. But if you're called to be a religious, if you're called to be a priest, you have another gift. You become a spouse of Christ. You become a spouse of the mystical bride of Christ, the church. I was married, you know, at St. Peter's Basilica. I was married with 10,000 people at my wedding. On that day, I was espoused to the Bride of Christ, the Church, the mystical, beautiful Bride of Christ. And I love my beautiful Bride. <laughs> and I can tell you that our religious sisters love their spouse the Lord Jesus. And in that communion of love, 
In our espousal, new life is transmitted into the church. We bring forth children in the spiritual order. That's why they call us father, because we bring forth spiritual children. And celibacy is the charism that is the vehicle for the transmission of supernatural life. It is a gift given for the building up of the body of Christ. What a beautiful gift. Why would we throw it back in God's face, even if we could? 